On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome inside episode 428 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba, alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains on the heels of another Sens loss. The Ottawa Senators lose their fifth straight game. They fall 3-2, the final score to the Boston Bruins last night. We'll say, though, entertaining game from fights to big hits to momentum goals and the senators got their first goal from a defenseman we'll tell you who that is and more plus speaking of defenseman josh brown just added to the nhl's covid protocol list so you can put that into now six members of the team so we'll discuss what could be next the senators are supposed to play Tomorrow night at home against the LA Kings, we'll discuss whether there's a chance that that is postponed. All that plus the Belleville Senators back in action. This is the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day. Today is Wednesday, November 10th in Pilsey. Eight losses in their last nine games. I'm starting to think this Sens team might not be playoff bound. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of runway left, but uh, the takeoff certainly isn't looking very good here, Ross. Uh, What's Andrew Hammond up to? (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. But, I mean, I don't even know if the Hamburglar could solve this team's problems, Ross. But, hey, saying that, last night was a much better effort than the last couple games we've seen. And especially considering you're going up against a powerhouse team like the Boston Bruins and... This team hasn't been this shorthanded in a long time. Like, guys coming up uh, from Belleville, uh, key players, like half the decor is gone. Not that, not that that was that big of a detriment, to be honest. But still, big changes to the Senators roster. DJ Smith had a lot of changes he needed to deal with and figure out. And I thought this team, considering the circumstances, played a very good game end. Only a one goal loss, right? Like this wasn't a 5-1 beatdown like the last couple of games we've seen. A 3-2 loss at the hands of the Boston Bruins here is not that bad. Yeah, not bad at all. When you look at how the game started, shout out if you're following along. At Send Central, gave you a quick lock. And that was at plus 500 at bet online for Zach Sanford to score a goal. And turns out he scored in the exact same fashion as he did in Game 7 of the 2019 Stanley Cup Final, exactly the last time he played in Boston. It was his birthday, too, so you love to see all that. The momentum, the vibes, everything was great, Pilsy. How could they not stretch their lead? Because I'm starting to see a trend here, and it's not one that I like. The Sens have scored six times. They've opened the scoring six times, and they've only won two of those games. Yeah, it's brutal. Uh, like normally, the the odds when a team scores first, if you go to betonline.ag, are drastically in that team's favor. It's like stats for when teams score first and if they win or not are usually heavily skewed. That yes, they do indeed win, and the Ottawa Senators can't seem to get that to work out for them. But I want to talk about this goal because. Man, they should have put the C on Brady Kachuk a long time ago because he is playing like an animal out there. Ever Point since per this, game as captain. Ever since they slapped the C on his chest, he's been doing so amazing. And that play was absolutely incredible. Pilsy, are we saying he's been captain for three games? Because he knew before the game against, uh, who was it last Thursday? Vegas. He knew before that game that he was going to be named captain. He had a goal there. He had a goal uh, Saturday against Tampa. And then this beauty assist on Sanford's goal. Yeah, I mean, this whole play is Brady Kachuk. Like, Sanford's just lucky to be there. Like, he, he gets the giveaway. Stick handles in a phone booth in the high slot. Right away, gets the puck on net, as Brady Kachuk always does. Then, as he's falling down, he corrals it, stick handles it, and then sends it over to a wide-open Sanford, who... I mean, it it doesn't get much easier than that to get a birthday goal. So that's an amazing play to start things off. And hey, I'll eat my words. I said I didn't think Sanford was quite ready to go from fourth line to first line. And I thought he played pretty well there. And I think it was, 
I don't know if uh, we're going to see him stay in the top six, but at least it's showing that if there is some injury troubles, there's a guy you can comfortably move up to the lineup. Very fair. Now, he got a, he got shifts with that line throughout. I mentioned on yesterday's show, I thought it could be a situation where he flip-flops with Igor or Tyler Ennis or anyone on that right side. Drake Batherson played the 18-20 as well. The, the time on ice was pretty interesting. We'll get into that about last night's game as well because – you look at it, and we should have mentioned this on yesterday's show, so apologies for not, but when we discussed Connor Brown missing a game, that was the first game he's missed since 2016 in the NHL. He had the fourth longest Ironman streak. It was at 384 games, so pretty unfortunate that he was out. We'll get into what Igor did replacing him on the right side, but you're right. Sanford played well, man, for over 15 and a half minutes. Four shots on goal, two hits, a block, three takeaways, which I really like to see. And that was noticeable out there. Ever since that Dallas back check, this guy's just stripping pucks. And if he can add that to his arsenal, he's just going to be that much more valuable for this team. So good on Zach Sanford making the most of this opportunity in the final year of his contract. Now, the real problem here was the Senators not finding a way to convert on the power play. They had a five on three For about 30 seconds, and they go 0 for 6 in the game. How much do you discredit the Sens' power play being the reason why they lost last night's game? I mean, massive. When you go 0 for 6, like, a team as... And when the other team scores on theirs. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And a team that's as, like, championship pedigree and disciplined as the Boston Bruins usually are, you don't get a lot of times where they're giving up 6 power plays. So, to not score on a single one of those is pretty brutal, but... I will say I really like DJ Smith's move to call a timeout in the first when they were about to get that five on three, right? Like that's a move where I think a traditional hockey coach would be like, ah, you're wasting your time out. Like you got to wait till the third period because now look, you're down by a goal and you, you trying to get the net empty and you don't have a timeout. So you waste it. I don't, I don't buy that. I think you need to take a look at the game. DJ Smith saw they had some momentum here. They were just, they were on a four on three, about to go to a five on three. So he gets his top unit out there. His top unit was already out there for a considerable amount of time. So he gets them a breather. Let's talk about how to set up this five on three. And unfortunately, pretty much five seconds after that timeout, Josh Norris bobbles the puck at the blue line. It clears the zone. And that's kind of all a waste. But the process is there. Like that, I think that was the right move. Now, the second power play unit, there's a couple guys off that uh, unit. Uh, Igor Sokolov had to replace Connor Brown, so that's definitely a change there. And Igor Sokolov, your first NHL game, no practice time whatsoever, and being put on the second power play unit, like it's going to be tough to adjust, but I thought he did well there. And yeah, if the Sens are going to have any chance winning these games, especially close games, you need to get that power play clicking. I mean, they had a bunch of shots, I think at one point, uh, with five power play opportunities they had like eight shots on net so it's not like the chances weren't there I think the biggest problem Ross was entering the zone with the power play there was a lot of times where they were trying to enter the zone and it was just obvious I think everyone could tell especially the Boston Bruins penalty killers that when they were about to enter the zone whoever had the puck that was the only option like it wasn't like someone carrying the puck had options if if uh, a defender got too close to him or whatever like They just knew, all right, this guy's right about to hit the blue line, smother him, and we're going to stop this zone entry, and then we'll get it out of here. And I feel like that's what happened at least four or five times there. Oh, my God. The Sens power play. Don't get me started on it. One for 19 since their game in Minnesota. One in their last 19. The thing is, Ross, though, like, it really shouldn't be this bad. Like, it doesn't have to be dominant, but their top power play unit – is incredible on paper, right? Like you got Norris, Batherson, Stutzla, Shabbat, Kachuk. Like that, that's a, a really good five-man unit. And then their second power play unit has actually been buzzing. Like they've actually been producing chances. They just can't seem to score, which is the frustrating thing. Like it's not like last year's power play where you're like, this legitimately is never going to work. Yeah, like they're fair. doing the drop pass way too much. No one's in sync here. Dadanov is just a pylon out there. You know, like last year, we were like, this power play isn't going to work. There's so many reasons why they're not successful. This year, apart from breaking into the zone, they should be successful. Yeah, well, the first unit, at least. The second unit, eh, we'll see. For me, it wasn't even the first period power play. Yeah, the five on three would have been really nice. But when David Pasternak took that penalty, they called it roughing against Shabbat. It was a high stick. 
six seconds into the second period. That one you need to convert on the fresh sheet of ice. And DJ Smith after the game mentioned that the ice was bad and that was a part of the reason why the power play wasn't successful. I mean, yeah, sure, Boston did get their power play goal just like deflected off of Brad Marchand on the side. It wasn't like it was a beautiful passing play. But with a fresh sheet of ice, I don't think that's a very good excuse. And after that power play, Pilsy, the one at the start of the second, Ottawa goes 10 minutes without a shot on goal. They go from being up one nothing during that stretch to down 2-1. And to me, yeah, sure, they tie it up after that, but it really felt like that's where the wind was sucked out of the send sails. Yeah, definitely. And and like you mentioned, like that power play goal is a tough one to give up because Pasternak misses the net by like a foot there. But luckily there's a guy standing right there and it banks off him and it hits off Marchand and goes in. So it's not like that was like a brutal defensive breakdown or you just got schooled by a, a good power play unit. Like that was just kind of a lucky play. I'm sure Pasternak will tell you that's what he was trying to do. But uh yeah, and that ties it up 1-1. One, one. The the next goal, this is where I have a little bit of a tough time with Matt Murray. Like, that's not good goaltending positioning there. He's too deep in his net. You can't let a guy like uh, Derek Forbert beat you cleanly like that, especially on the far side there. And another thing, like, I don't want to trash Matt, Matt Murray. Usually we're sticking up for him, goalie-friendly show. But there was a couple times, like... That, I guess we can get to it now, but uh, speaking of Pasternak and Thomas Shabbat, those two were battling all night, and Pasternak dumps Shabbat into the corner, like absolutely just dumps him. And then I love this play from Shabbat, though, because Shabbat doesn't just like hang his head and he's like, ah, oh, crap, and slowly gets up. He's he's into the game at that moment. He's pissed off that that happened. He focuses on the puck. He dials in on Pasternak. Matt Murray is diving over to get his stick over to make that save. But it's Thomas Shabbat's resilience and uh, really like uh, initiative that he's like, I'm getting there and stopping that puck. He yeah. stops the puck from crossing the line and then gives past a, a cross check right after. Like, I love that intensity from Thomas Shabbat. And that's something I want to see more of. Now, what I wanted to get to there, though, is Matt Murray so many times he just hasn't, he's not agile. Like there's so many times where he's stuck in his position. And then when something changes on him, he's done. Like he just freezes and he flops over. Like that's a situation where you should have been able to push your pad over from that butterfly position and not have to make a sprawling stick save that also your defenseman needs to rush from the corner to stop on the goal line. Right. So there's, there is some times where I'd like to see Matt Murray get a little more agile and those types of plays hopefully wouldn't be as dangerous. And the temperature was turned off the shift before, right? So that that's the one you're talking about. And then we got to get into that hit from yeah. Josh Brown. Murderer's row. That's what Josh Brown needs to bring more and more to this, this team. There was a split second from that initial camera. I thought Charo was back in Ottawa. That number three, the <laughs> yeah. 2D jersey, yep. just standing up in neutral ice and flattening Trent Frederick. And I respect that there didn't have to be a fight right yes. after a clean hit. We'll get to the six scrap later in the game. Shout out Alex Formanton, friend of the show. But when you look at just that was shoulder to chest and you got to keep your head up, kid. I mean, that's about as textbook of an open ice hit as there is. And yep. Trent Frederick, he left the game immediately after that and did not return. So I, I bet he's going to be missing some time and definitely a concussion spotter said, yeah, you got to get off the ice there. But that's the thing, like, Josh he's, get, he's given a few of those out, though, too, Trent Frederick. So we wish him well, but he's a tough customer. He knows when he straps on the skates. It's a physical game out there. Yeah, I mean, what goes around comes around, right? So, um, and that's the thing. Like, Josh Brown, that's a bag of tricks that he needs to be using more often because, no offense, he doesn't have a lot of bag of tricks. So when you can do that and really make an impact like that, that's going to go a long way. But, however, Josh Brown has been placed in COVID protocol, so he's not going to be able to kind of bounce bounce from that and uh, continue that physical dominance. But that's a yet another piece of this decor that's now in COVID protocol. And then, speaking of decor, the Sens finally got a goal from their defenseman. We'll touch on that afterwards. Wrap up the game last night against the Boston Bruins in which Bruce Cassidy, Ottawa native, got his 200th win as an NHL coach and the crossbar that was so Close. All that after a word from our friends at Built Bar. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar. If you've been watching us on YouTube, 
Built Bar has got the YouTube ads going. Shout out Built Bar. The mix box is always the way to go. Mix in 16 amazing flavors, and they're all great for the health conscious guy or girl because you can lose or maintain weight while indulging in these delicious treats. They look like candy bars, but they give you all the nutritional benefits of a protein bar. They're low in calorie, they're low in sugar, but they're high in protein and high in fiber. And that's a nutritional grand slam. They're soft and easy to chew, and you can get yours right now because your listener, the Locked On Senators podcast, you're getting a 15% off your next order. How's that? Just use promo code LOCKED15. Promo code LOCKED15. It's Built Bar, a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. Go to BuiltBar.com and use promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your next order. Oh, yeah, it is Built Bar season, that's for sure. But also, guys, now that Halloween's over, you want to get a step ahead on your holiday shopping. And the best way to do that, Ross, you don't even need to leave your house. You don't even need to leave the couch. Leave it to Shopify. And everyone knows if you're looking for something, Shopify can provide it. But if you're a business trying to provide a service, Shopify is also a great spot for you. It gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big businesses. So upstarts, startups, established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. That sounds good to me. Scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility. Shopify powers over 1.7 million businesses. Why not add your name to the list from first sale to full scale? reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain all the insights you need as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. So get all the stats you want. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility powered by Shopify. Guys, Go to shopify.com slash locked on NHL, all lowercase for locked on NHL, for a free 14 day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash locked on NHL right now. Guys, shopify.com slash locked on NHL. This is possibility powered by Shopify. All right, Pilsy. So we basically got through half the game there. It's 2-1 Boston. Ottawa goes 10 minutes without a shot on goal. And you just knew it would be a cheeky one, eh? Nikita Zaitsev, comrade Z, gets the Senators' first goal from a defenseman. Does that surprise you? It's taken this long? Uh, yes and no, because the, oh, hello, um, the Ottawa Senators, they don't really have, like, apart from Thomas Shabbat, they don't have the offensive flair defenseman. And I mean, Thomas Shabbat has so much to worry about. He doesn't have time to be scoring goals. He's got enough on his plate already. So part of it doesn't surprise me. What surprises me though, Ross, is Zaitsev scored from about six to eight feet closer than his usual spot. So he's getting closer to the net there. But that one tips off uh, Bruins defenseman and goes in. I think everyone in the building watching on TV was shocked that that one went in. But ties the game up at two. And you're sitting there thinking, well, we had a god-awful second period. We've missed on so many power play opportunities. But hey, we're still in this game. Yeah, they certainly were. And then, so they tie it up briefly. Uh, Shabbat and Tyler Ennis. Tyler Ennis, by the way, is it the quietest seven points in 12 games you've ever seen? But it was short-lived. Patrice Bergeron, I feel like we mushed this on the show by mentioning that he has more goals against Ottawa than any other yeah. team in the National Hockey League. And he gets a nice play, finished us off from Pasternak and Charlie McAvoy, who was my lookout player, McAvoy, and he was unreal. Had a few huge hits in that game as well. So they get that one, a momentum goal, as we said, less than two minutes left in the period. And then the third, like, how would you describe that third period? I thought the effort was there for sure. They were a crossbar away from tying it. But how, how many times can you be like, oh, we, we were almost there without actually getting over the hill? Well, I think it's ironic that you're asking me this because it sounds like we're talking about Pilsy's parlay of the day here, right? <laughs> one, <laughs> right. one goal away on all of them, right? Yep. So I can understand that. But before we move on, I want to talk about that play a little because that was a weird play that Bergeron scored on because Josh Norris busted his stick 
and then he had to go or he didn't bust it. I think he just dropped it or some somehow he lost a stick. So he had to leave the zone to try to get it. But there was also another broken stick on the play and the pass hits that broken stick. Bergeron has to bobble it and he figures it out and then he gets the goal. The one thing I would like to say there, and normally we don't get too hard on Zub though, is he's kind of puck watching at that point. Like when, when that puck hits that broken stick and he sees Patrice Bergeron standing there, you got to try to be a little more aggressive there. I mean, that's nitpicking, but these are the kind of small things where if you let the NHL's game breakers, the NHL superstars like Patrice Bergeron have that time and space, even for a second or two, they're going to make you look foolish. And that's what happened there. That's exactly what happened. And, you know, when you go up against these top end teams, you have to play up to the competition. You can't allow them to dominate games. So, unfortunately, that's the case here in last night's loss. The Senators now five losses in a row and eight of their last nine games. When Let's... will the beatings end, or could they become like the LA Kings, their next opponent who lost their first six games and then won their next yeah. six games? So you got a team coming in here who is raring to go. And I think that's a little dangerous when you look at this Sens team who's so beat up right now due to COVID and otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I watched their highlights uh, from last night's game and they got some... This is... This is not your big brother's L.A. Kings team, Ross. Like, they've got some <laughs> speed now, you know? It's not just the big, slow guys like Lucic and all these big guys. But uh, they're a different team now. But before you head, uh, head over to that game, there's a couple things we need to talk about, too. Let's get into... Where do you want to go first, uh, Ross? Igor Sokolov or Brandstrom? Because these are these were two big storylines of the night that we need yeah, to get into. Yeah, let's go with Brandstrom first. Okay, Brands from first. Now, here's also the, one thing I want to mention too is people on Twitter I think have a have a warped idea of what Brands from is. Like all this the savior talk is a little silly. I think like really guys, Eric Brands from is like a false prophet if we're talking about that and Jake the real deal Sanderson, he's like that's the guy we need to be waiting for as the savior because Brandstrom can help this team, but I don't think he can save it. Whereas when you get a two-way guy like Sanderson who can not only defend well, but also bring the puck up the ice well, and for everyone saying he has no offensive upside, well, he's pretty much ended that debate. So that's the guy that's going to be the savior here. Sure, uh, Brandy may look better in pictures and the memes might be a bit better, but uh, I don't think we need to be putting those types of expectations on Eric Branstrom right now. No, I think what you saw last night, I mean, still an upgrade over what the decor looked like over the last five yeah, games. Yeah. He's fearless for better and worse because he got smoked, what, three times? At Twice least. by Curtis Lazar? yeah. Yeah, and right. and this is the thing. Like, uh, we we like Branstrom on the show. I I've admittedly probably been too high on Branstrom. Like every time we do our prospect list, Ross, I feel like the one thing that we have different is I'm always telling you we got to get Branstrom up a spot here or something like that. And so I don't want people to get it twisted here, but man, oh man, I don't know. Like he looks like he's not growing in size in my eyes. It seems like he's shrinking every time I see him. It looks like he's smaller and smaller and we all know it. He gets hit hard. No matter where he plays, he gets hit hard because guys see that he has, he's a puck moving defenseman. That's small. So he's focusing on moving the puck. He's got his head down and guys are licking their chops being like, I'm going to crunch this guy here. And that's what happens. But like you said, Brandy's fearless. Like it hasn't stopped him too much, but I'm worried once those hits start to add up and take their toll, he's going to start playing with some hesitancy or he's going to be making rash decisions to get rid of the puck to avoid a big hit, which you can't or blame he's gonna him. Get, I mean, or he's literally going to die. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, like you can't blame hurt. him. He's looking out for his own safety and that's, no, but that's he, totally fair. He hasn't been. Like that play at the blue line where he's bringing it over, he goes into a, a like a cluster of brooms and he just gets absolutely rocked. The hit you and I saw him take in Laval in the Belleville oh season opener God. was maybe the biggest hit I've seen and in loud. the last few years. Yeah. It was insane. And the fact that it's such a trend is really concerning. However, Brandy moves pucks, and he certainly did. I thought that the breakout was a lot smoother when he was out there on the ice. Uh, should we get into Igor briefly? Well, and also, I just want to say, like, Branstrom was given the opportunity to succeed here, right? Like, he started with Zub. DJ Smith obviously didn't like that, sent him back down with Josh Brown. And Branstrom, he had almost four minutes of power play time, three minutes and 38 seconds. So, like, 
he was given the keys to quarterback that second power play unit. And when you get six power play opportunities, you're going to get your chances there. Also, just a quick note too. Every This is like a, a time on ice weird stat that I don't think I've ever seen. Every single player on the Senators except Josh Brown had power play time on ice. Mind you, a lot of that is four seconds, 14 seconds. But right, it's, right. it's weird to notice that every single guy got a touch on the power play and you still can't score. But the thing with Branstrom is... I think, yes, he he moves the puck up ice well. And I think that's something that the Ottawa Senators really need. But they need guys that can help them keep the puck out of their own net more than anything. So Branstrom is going to help this team, yes, depending on how long he stays here. I mean, with the COVID protocol looking like this, he's going to be here at least another week probably. Um, He's going to help this team, but we need a lot more than this to really right the ship here. Yep, and when you look at the... Shot share, it's not pretty for Branstrom or really anyone on the team. The only no guys shots in, for Branny. The only guys above 50% were Nick Paul and Drake Batherson. Tim Stutz left 44% was the next best, who is still sitting on zero goals yeah. this season. Igor Sokolov uh, only played 550 at even strength, got some power play touches, like you mentioned, as well. But for him, it was the battle that I loved. It was him yep. going in deep creating havoc, using his big body, and really positioning himself in those scrums in the offensive zone. And he came out with the puck with a few times. So DJ Smith made note that he wanted to get him some more t- some more opportunity just with the way that the game and all the penalties both ways, it was hard to get into a rhythm. So I'm really excited to see him going into the next game and see what he can do to take his game to the next step. But awesome to see the, the lap there before the game, the rookie lap, and uh, just an absolute beauty. So Really happy to see him get his first NHL game. And since prospects noted that Igor Sokolov is the first second round pick from the 2020 draft to play an NHL game, which is even more exciting when you think that he was the second last pick in that second round. And everyone was like, why would Ottawa waste a second round pick on an overager? Yeah. So, yeah. Hmm. But, anyways, going on to Sokolov's game. I'll echo a lot of your statements. I thought he played well when he was out there. And man, how like he doesn't even have to do much if he's in front of the net. Like Jeremy Swayman was struggling to see past Igor. Like that is yeah. a big body in front. And I think maybe, I think Igor might be, I don't know, like he's a big body in front of the net and he can battle like you mentioned, but I think you kind of want him in a higher slot position so you can use that shot on the power play. Five on five, I think that's the right spot for him. But now that he's going to get, hopefully, I uh, I don't know what's going to go on with the Sens practices and the game upcoming here, but hopefully he can get some practice time and get some uh, reps in with that second power play unit to kind of get some chemistry there. And I think we're going to see some uh, some nice showings from Igor. And yeah, just I don't like it just warms your soul to see a guy like that succeed because everybody's cheering for him. He's such a happy go lucky guy, and I think he really brings a boost of morale to this locker room. The problem is apparent. The third period needs to be better. The second period needs to be better. First period's great. They're starting on time. They're they're looking good right out of the gate. But you look at that worst third period goal differential in the NHL, and they're 0-5 when trailing after two periods. Just simply not going to win a lot of games when it comes down to that. Their road record under DJ Smith in 67 games has now fallen to 17-42 And eight, that's 50 losses in 67 games if you're scoring at home. So keep that in mind next time you go to betonline.ag and when you're picking the sends on the road, know that you're doing it in a risky situation. Although the odds were plus 270 on the sends money line last night. So Vegas knew, Vegas knew. We'll give them credit for that. We can give you a 50% welcome bonus credit if you sign up right now for betonline.ag. Here's how you do it. You go to betonline.ag, sign up for a free account today, and just put in our promo code. It's that easy. Put in promo code locked on. Promo code locked on gets you a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. So don't sit on the sidelines anymore. Get into the action and don't forget that promo code. What is it? Locked on to receive a 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. It's Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. All right, Pillsy. So the Senators are now three, eight, eight and one. And one. Three, eight, and one. Um, what are you most confident about this team right now? <laughs> <laughs> wow, way, way to tee that one up for me. Um, 
You know what? Like, I, I'm going to reference last night's game because I really do mean it. That was the best, like, effort considering the circumstances that we've seen. Like, that really went back to years past with DJ Smith when, sure, the Senators weren't winning games, as you mentioned, the road record. But they were a hard team to win against. Like, teams couldn't just chalk up an automatic W. Like, you had to grind it out to beat the Senators. And that's what it seemed like last game. And... I do want to talk about uh, Alex Formanton's fight there. Like that was just first uh, first career fight in the NHL, also. And what's that? No, I said yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were muted there. No, that's um, awesome. Yeah, and that's the kind of fight that I want. Like not a staged fight. Just let's a few on- cross checks the face. I was going to say, let's be honest here and call a spade a spade. For me, cross checks him right in the mouth there. So I think I that would want piss him. anyone off. I'd like him when he's a dirty player. Like, I want him to mix it up a little more than he has. Maybe this it's just getting comfortable. That's what I'm saying. Like, be on the ice and be like, this is my zone. Like, don't be a pedestrian out there. Take over. And Formanton, he had another couple breakaways. One where he gets uh, McAvoy trips him up. So yep. that's a great job drawing a penalty, getting their best defender off the ice. And, and then that fight just being like, He's not backing down at all. Like, they're nose-to-nose screaming at each other's face. And Formi just said, I, enough of this talk. Let's go. And Formi definitely won that fight. Like, if you go to HockeyFights.com, oh, yeah. the, the win majority has got to be through the roof. Because that was an excellent showing by Formi. And, hey, if you can get a young kid whose main attribute is his speed and skill to step up like that, that shows a good message to the rest of the team that this whole team's in the fight. Even the guys that really aren't supposed to be doing that they're willing to stick up for themselves and show that uh, they're not going to back down. So I love seeing that from Formy. Now, Pelzi, this is uh, up to the minute, and therefore things could change. But you said in the fight, well, the Senators have six players who will not be in the fight yeah. for a little while. As I'm pulling up on our YouTube page, the list of six Senators, three forwards, and three defensemen who are currently in the NHL's COVID protocol. And we should add Jack Capuano, associate coach in there, but we just have the list of players up front. Oops, I spelt Austin as though it's Austin Matthews. Apologies, Waddy, for that. Yikes. But you got Austin Watson, Connor Brown, and Dylan Gambrell. And then on defense, Nick Holden, Victor Mete. And now the most recent is Josh Brown. So say what you want about the Sens decor, whether or not they're any good, but half of them are out of the lineup due to the COVID protocol. So what do you do going into this game against the LA Kings, assuming that everything goes on Somebody's got to get called up. Is it Jacob Bernard Docker? Is it Lassie Thompson who just got back from injury? What's the play? I don't know. It's an interesting uh, problem they've got here, Ross, because also consider Belleville plays tonight. They play uh, at Place Bell up against uh, the, the Laval Rockets. So, I mean, it's the point. I, I feel so bad for Troy Mann. Has any AHL coach had to deal with no. the amount of roster transactions as him. I don't think so. There's no way. There's literally, there's no way. And thank God they got attached or affiliated with the Atlanta Gladiators because they can't just keep calling guys off the street and from the 67s that don't happen to be playing to play for the Belleville Senators. So We're ready if they need a goalie. I got to stretch a little, Ross. Uh, so you hop in for the first game. I'll get some stretching done and uh, dust off the old pillows, and then yeah. uh, I can come in and back up. But, uh, yeah, definitely uh, it's tough for Troy Mann. Now, back to your original question of who would get called up in this scenario. I don't think it should be Lassie just only because he just got back from injury. So just getting back from injury, getting called up in a frantic uh, rush situation where you don't get time to practice or anything – I don't think is a very good move and it's not setting him up to succeed. Like we always talk about. However, guy like Jacob Bernard Docker already has NHL experience. My two, a couple games, small sample size, but also I think he's been playing well in Belleville. I think Troy Mann will tell you the same. And if you need a guy for a couple spot starts, he's your guy. Like I would say in case of emergency, break glass and use Jonathan Aspero, but I don't think he's healthy, healthy for that. So he's out for like six weeks. Yeah, so that's the problem there. Um, this is a scenario where I, I kind of w- well, if they got Hetherington and guys like that, but I wish Belleville would have got like a a real legit fringe NHL defenseman to kind of sturdy things back there. But who, who anticipates these kind of things going on? You can only plan so much. So it's going to be a tough situation. But I I would say the right guy is probably JBD at this time. I think it'd be awesome to see JBD up. I think that he's put in the work and he got a little taste last season, but 
I think that the two goal performance he's coming off of a few games ago now when uh, Rochester was in town, I think that it's just kind of given him a little extra jolt of confidence. And from what I'm hearing down there is that he looks good and he's working as a tail off in practice. And I think that it would be a good reward for JBD. Now, knowing it's going to be just like a one or two game stint. Yeah. I think that if it was a longer term injury for somebody up top, then maybe you go with Lassie because I think he's ultimately closer to being a more NHL ready defenseman. But as of right now, you've got Lassie Thompson, a guy who's only played, I believe, one game, maybe two. He's played um, one game since October 23rd. Yeah. Okay. He got an assist in that game. He looked good. Yeah. But I think that you just let him marinate a little bit longer because Belleville's in action tonight. And it's a tough matchup at Laval against Calder Trophy. Nope. No, no. Cup. Calder Cup. Hopeful. Cole, Cole Caulfield. Caulfield. Calder Cup. Yeah. But we can't be mean to him. Otherwise, we might get canceled. <laughs> you see that tweet? I was gonna if if anyone's getting canceled for being mean to Cole Caulfield, I think it might be you, Ross. No, come on. I'm not even mean. I'm just poking a little fun. And what what sports without a little fun between organizational rivalry? I've never said he's bad. I just said that Shane Pinto is better. But uh his dad took offense to a tweet wondering where Cole Caulfield was. Kind of early to send it in the first period from uh, from the Utica <laughs> Comets. And I won't yeah. get into the whole uh, problem of it being like you know there's been other issues in the national hockey league and then uh, a small white guy gets uh, made fun of a little bit on twitter and everything has to get deleted and an apology issued and all that um, i do think that it's a little soft but at the same time i i get that they don't want their teams chirping players on the other <laughs> team that's yeah. it's of course ken campbell wrote that article no surprise that he's the guy who picks that up but hey it's a good test for the belleville sense today Going up against Laval, a team who has called their tr tr trophy cup. I keep mixing that up. I but, always do that too. Yeah, they need to switch one of them. Like, come yeah. on, guys. There's What's enough legends in the game of hockey. You could you could mix it up a little bit, right? Honestly, jeez. So what are you hoping to see from Belleville? This is a team that's real shorthanded tonight, but they've been playing some of their best hockey of late too. Yeah, tonight up against Belleville, I don't have high expectations because, like we said, they're they're missing a lot of their key players as well. Um, so, really, what I want to see is stick to the process here. Like, Troy Mann is a great coach, and he has these guys buying into his system, even though half the time it's new guys that he has to teach his new system. But if they can play sound hockey, I'm not expecting a W here because it's a tough task, but just play the proper way here and try to rely on your goaltending. Your goaltending has been hot lately. Hopefully I'm sure it's probably going to be mad. Sogard in the pipes tonight. Hopefully he can stand on his head and uh, help shut the door here. And maybe the Sens can squeak away uh, a low scoring win here. Yeah. I would like to see it because any win in the organization right now is yeah. huge. Cause uh, we tweeted out this morning, this uh, photo of, Ben Affleck at his worst and Bill Clinton at his worst. And that's us kind of limping into today's show because the hope that was eternal through the off season has just flattened. It is dead. This team is what? Third last in the national hockey league. Fourth you can put last. sense fans hope on COVID protocol list as well. Add yeah. that there. Well, no, because that comes off in 10 to 14 days. Whereas this well, is, hopefully that happens. <laughs> this is, this is tough right now, Pilsy. Yeah. It is tough. And uh, all we need here, I think to turn the tide is get Timmy on the score sheet. Like at least the coach understands this slump and understands the importance of the player because if he was in a different situation, I think he'd be down in the bottom six, maybe getting his ice time cut a little bit. But no forward on the Ottawa Senators last night played more. Uh, I lied. Uh, Josh Norris is the only Ottawa Senator that played more. Timmy was on the ice for 20 minutes and 51 seconds. Wow, I don't know how long time. we could just say it's only a matter of time. He had another four shots on goal. It's just not going in for him. And you can kind of sense his confidence is disintegrating. Yeah, and I mean, that's it's tough for being a young superstar who has a lot of pressure on them and who's used to scoring these kinds of goals that it's just not happening. So, yeah, Ross, do we want to say it again? Eventually, it's going to happen. And Eventually, uh, it's, hey, I called the Zach Sanford goal yep. last night. I'm calling it. Tim Stutzla will score against the Los Angeles Kings, the team that passed on him 
in the draft. I was going to say, there's some tie-ins here because not only did they pass on him, but also their owner has a lot of German connections, right? Ooh. We thought it was almost a slam dunk that they were going to take him because of his German connections, but that wasn't the case. So maybe he wants to sprinkle a little revenge in there for Tim Stutzla. So I I'm with you, Ross. Let's let's hop on that. Or maybe I shouldn't be with you. Then I'll mush it. I don't know no, what to do. I am locking it in. Tim Stutzla will score his first goal of the season and we'll give you the odds of that on tomorrow's show it was entertaining though right pilsy before Definitely. like to wrap it up i last had fun watching game. that game yeah, yeah absolutely i had fun i was fired up big hit from josh brown uh nice play by brady sanford gets his first on his birthday form he gets the fight batherson hits the crossbar in the third like oh and more goalie content. The last thing we got to pull Yes. Oh, my God. Thank go. God. I, I would have been pissed if we forgot about this. Go ahead. Philip Gustafson is now the third person to wear Anton Forsberg's gear. We remember the Artie party. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Artem Anisimov last year didn't get to go on the bench or take warm-ups. He was just the e-bug in the back room. We got photos, though. Thank God. But yeah. last night, Philip Gustafson had to take warm-ups in Anton Forsberg's equipment. Like, what? That is wild. And, like, we're both goalies, uh, goalies out there. Like, you might as well be naked out there if it's not your own equipment. Now, I'm not, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know the size comparisons between Forsberg and Gustafson. Pretty maybe, similar. Maybe you can it, look that up quickly imagine while I'm going it, here. But. Ma imagine if it was Sogard's equipment. <laughs> You're swimming in this stuff. I mean, and the thing, too, is, like, Oh man, when Josh Norris bowled over Matt Murray, yeah, nice. When Josh Norris bowled over Matt Murray, I was like, oh man, if Gus has to go in here with another Tendies equipment after an emergency call up, like that's going to be tough on him. So that's I'm worse so than an Ebo. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Because it's, you're so used to your equipment that any change will really have an effect. Like maybe people Down might think skates. I'm crazy, but the, like, the skates is the biggest thing, Ross. The skates is the <laughs> biggest thing for sure. Because Everything else, if it doesn't fit, it's just big stuff designed to block stuff, whatever. Right. But your skates, if your foot's loose or you got your toes curled like this at the end of it, that's going to really affect how you play on there. So I was so relieved, not only because we want to see Matt Murray healthy, obviously, but that Gus didn't have to go in there when he got knocked over because that's so unfortunate to put that kid in a situation like that. Yeah, well, the Senators are back on home ice. Hopefully they can find Philly's gear. <laughs> Because nobody knows where it is. I think it, it, pro it probably went to Laval with the team, right? So oh, it's, maybe. That was probably the issue is it was in a separate, I don't know, truck, plane, bus, whatever. And Gustafson wasn't able to get it with him and go. So that's just wild. Do you know how they could have avoided that? Let's hear it. If they didn't send him yeah, down for absolutely no reason on, on Sunday. And uh, hey, they did. And that's, that's kind of what we get is a little content out of it. So glad we didn't miss that story at the end. And, We've got plenty more to preview tomorrow because the LA Kings are a similar team in the sense of going through a rebuild like Ottawa, but they seem to have put the next gear onto it. What do they have that the Sens don't? We'll discuss that tomorrow, Pilsy. For today, we say goodbye. For Brandon Pillar, I'm Ross Levitan. This has been the Locked On Senators Podcast. Your team.